it's you again. Welcome. Oh, oh no. Hi, I'm Mark. I've been a professional artist for 200 years and now I teach art for a living. In this week's YouTube Art School episode, we're looking at five shading mistakes that you're probably making. No, that you're definitely making. Everybody does. But of course, the point of this class will be to show you how to fix those mistakes and get much better results. Epic. Uh-oh, quickly, let's get this class started. class is in session. Pay attention, you hear me? Shading is hard. As a teacher, I see the mistakes that I'm about to show you in today's class all the time. Flat shading, muddy shading. Ugh. We'll look at five of the biggest mistakes that my students usually make. For a free art class, you're about to earn a lot of art XP. Wait, I just lied. It's not free. You're gonna have to pay the class fee of either one like or one sub. I trust you not to steal. All right, let's get started. Ah! The first mistake is definitely the most common. Flat shading. Oh, no, no. Let's take this example here. It's always tempting to go right in here and start adding details with shading. That's the point, right? We add shading to represent the light hitting different surfaces and also the absence of light in the shadow. We use shading to convey form or volumes when the result looks flat though. It's usually because you went right into the details without giving proper attention to the supporting volumes. If I take this arguably pretty flat result here and add like overall shading, well, suddenly we have something that looks a lot more convincing. What did I add though? It's just this basic shading for the volume supporting the features. You should always start by shading the supporting volumes first. Make sure those are convincing and then move on to smaller and smaller details. Don't go into details too early. You're basically guaranteeing that you're getting flat results. Now, the second shading mistake is even more common actually. Don't use custom brushes to shade until you can shade with a basic soft brush. What? You're gonna tell me what to do? Let me explain. To start shading, I always recommend a soft brush, a brush with soft edges, little to no texture. This will prevent a lot of problems that I see all the time when giving feedback to my students. And by the way, if you want to become one of my students, if you like how I teach, you should check out my art program. It's a complete art education with a massive curriculum. Works just the same if you have no experience or if you have a lot of experience. You can use almost any painting software for it and you get to go at your own pace, no stress. Make sure to use the coupon in the video description for a big discount on the program, valid until the end of the month only. The link to the art school program is in the description as well. Maybe check it out to see why almost 11,000 other students have joined. Now back to shading. As I was saying, custom brushes, bad. Basic soft brushes, good. The problem with using custom brushes is that most of the time they'll have hard edges. And that's hard to control if you don't have a lot of experience or a lot of dexterity. When your shading is not blended well, a couple problems start to show. Let's look at two of them. One is uh, you end up with a lot of noise in your painting, often in areas where there shouldn't be any. Maybe a simpler way to think about this, oftentimes at least, is you'll typically want to have more noise, visual noise around your focal point and very little noise elsewhere, or at least less relatively speaking. This helps our eyes focus on what's important because we're attracted to details and hard edges, visible brush strokes, they tend to create detail. It's like a magnet for the eyes. Because imagine, you have like a character that you want to show to people. You're proud of it. But your background is super busy, full of brush strokes. Something like this, maybe. Well, we end up being distracted by the background and it kind of robs your character from its spotlight. It ruins the piece. Now, of course, the obvious solution to that might be to like blur or smudge the hard edges if you find any. But that's often going to create the second problem, muddy shading. Usually if the blending part of shading is the issue, the smudging will be too. I would almost recommend like no smudging at all at first, just a basic brush and an eraser. Smudging can definitely be useful, but it requires as much dexterity, like as much pen dexterity as blending hard brush strokes or else the result will look muddy. Anyways, 
Keep it simple. I've done many full paintings with just the default Photoshop brush before. It works well, particularly to get clean shading. And custom brushes too, they're very useful, but they're like um, weapons in games that have like a minimum requirement to use them. The level one soft brush, on the other hand, it works great, has no level requirement, and it will probably carry you all the way until end game. Don't hate on it, it's a secret MVP. Now, the third shading mistake that I see my students make all the time, don't be afraid of contrast, specifically, use the full range of values when shading. Ideally, we want to use it all from pure black to full white and all the shades in between, unless you have like a specific style that requires a very limited value range for some reason. When you don't, your shading will oftentimes tend to look too dark or too bright, and that tends to look, let's say, um, uh, unappealing. Usually from what I've seen though, it'll tend to be specific to dark values, as in the painting will look too dark. Sometimes the shading will be too timid as well. Too light. But how can you tell? How can you face this? One thing you can do is uh, take any of your paintings like this and bring up the levels panel to double check. You know, if you're not sure that you're using the full range. The graph here should spread from left to right. So if you see something like this though on the other side, like there's nothing here. Well, that means none of these values are being used. We can quickly solve this by just bringing the little arrows back to wrap around the area of the graph that is actually being used. And now this works much better. Ideally, we'd have gone for that in the first place. But I get it though. Contrast can be scary. It reveals flaws way more easily than when you have low contrast. But you don't have to go right into high contrast right from the start. When you start shading, for example, start with the midtones. Start with very, very low contrast. And then slowly start to build up your shadows first, maybe on a separate layer. And then once that's done, you can move on to the highlights again on a separate layer and build those up little by little. Just make sure that by the end, you double check your levels again to make sure that you're using all the values that you can. You don't want to end up with muddy shading. Now, moving on to the fourth shading mistake, not using references. <gasps> Everything in art, all except maybe like your pen dexterity, is learned through observation. To shade properly, you gotta have a good example in front of you that you can observe. No references, no learning. And also, not all references are created equal. Just like I recommend that you paint using the full range of values, I recommend that you find references that do too. Avoid references that are under or overexposed. And also, avoid photos that were not shot in a controlled environment by a good photographer. You want photos with good lighting. Light is what gives form to everything. There's an art in capturing it in photos. Good ones are those lit by more than one light source coming from different directions where you get a lot of contrast in the values. And avoid using photos that we're taking with a flash or with any kind of light source head on where you lose all the shading information. Choose better references if you already use references and uh, start using references if you don't. Finally, the last mistake, the most common of them all, this time for real, is to not consider the light source. You should always consider where the light is in your scene if you're going to double in shading. Light is what allows us to see shading in the first place. It reveals form, like I just said. If painting a character, for example, the side of the character most directly pointing at the light source will usually be lighter in values, while the opposite side will be darker because the light is unable to reach there. It's not like a light switch though, where it's on and off. As we move from, you know, the area that's most directly lit by the light source, we gradually phase the light source less and less and less until we reach the terminator area, the transition zone between the highlights and the shadows, and then cross into the shadow sides, losing light intensity all along the way. It's a gradual transition. Make sure you think of this for every part of your painting, not just one area. Ask yourself, where's the light coming from? What is facing that light most directly? What is facing away from the light? And use the answers to guide your shading for a consistent result. Again, starting from big shapes first, and then details last. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's class. Was this useful? Let me know in the comments. Hopefully your shading level increases a lot after this, or at least a little. If it does, 
tell a friend and force them to subscribe. Also, if you feel like trying an amazing starter brush set to help in your shading adventures, a set that I actually use every day as my kind of like daily driver brush set, well, you can grab it for free in the video description as long as you use it responsibly. Now, slap the notification bell and make sure you're not late for class next week. See you then! Oh.